So welcome everyone to the third and final panel of this year's Photography Ethics Symposium. So I really appreciate everybody who is attending today for taking this time out of your, your afternoon or your morning, wherever you are, to, to join us for this conversation today. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, my name is Savannah Dodd. I'm the founder of the Photography Ethics Center and I will be facilitating today's event. Last year, we organized the very first Photography Ethics Symposium and we did it on the theme of working with people at the Royal Photographic Society House in Bristol. This year, due to obvious circumstances, we decided to move it online and instead of uh, making people sort of sit on their computers for an entire day, we decided it was maybe a little bit more palatable to break it up into three separate events instead of an all-day Zoom event. We were really fortunate this year um, to get support from the International Women's Media Foundation's Howard G. Buffett Fund for Women Journalists. So these events have been supported by the IWMF, which has been wonderful. Um, as part of this series, we first heard from, on October 1st, we heard from Smita Sharma and Laura Saunders on the theme of gender, power, and documenting vulnerability. On November 5th, we heard from Melissa Bunny Elian and Martha Tedesse on representation, identity, and intersectional storytelling. And today we're really fortunate to have two brilliant speakers here with us, Jenny Ricketts and John Edwin Mason, to speak on the topic of objectivity, truth, and lies. Um, at the end of this session, I will share with you the links uh, so that you can go back and listen to the other two panels if you missed them. I will introduce our two panelists today with us very shortly, um, but I'd like to get a little bit of housekeeping just out of the way before we begin. So today we'll start with each panelist giving us a brief 10 minute or so introduction um, to the theme and to how it relates maybe to their, their own work. Then the panelists will have a conversation about objectivity, truth, and lies, and that conversation will be prompted by questions both from me and from all of you. So please do feel free to put your questions um, through the Q&A feature and you can find that in your toolbar at the bottom of the Zoom window or you can pop it into the chat if that's easier. Um, so please do feel free to put your questions forward. Um, don't hold back. I know that we tend to, you know, people tend to hold back at the start and then we get a flood of questions at the end. So please don't hesitate to, to you know, raise your questions at any point and I will um, uh, read them out in due course. At the end of the session today, um, I'm going to pop a survey link into the chat and I would be really grateful if everybody would take the time to fill that out. Um, I will also include it in a follow-up email um, after the event, but it would be just really um, beneficial for me to know what works, what doesn't work, um, and it would be helpful to have that information to go back to the funder with after the event. So thank you very much in advance for taking the time to complete the survey. It's very short. Okay, <laughs> without further ado, um, I think we will st first hear from John Edwin Mason. So I would like to introduce uh, John here today. So John teaches African history and the history of photography at the University of Virginia. There he co-directs the Holsinger Portrait Project, which curates and exhibits century old portraits to introduce the public to the long ignored history of Charlottesville, Virginia's African American community. He's writing a book about Gordon Parks, the African-American photographer, writer, and filmmaker, and serves on the boards of Everyday Projects, Women Photograph, and The Aftermath Project. So thanks very much for joining us today, John. It's great to be here, Savannah. And hello, Jeannie. It's good to see you. Um, um, and good morning, everybody. Um, I want to start with a uh, good morning here in the United States. It's a brilliantly sunny morning, but it's really cold outside. But I want to start by, int by mm -hmm. introducing my, the kind of things that I think about. Now, I'm not a working photographer, even though I've done a number of photo projects. I'm an historian, and so I think of photography um, very much as an historian. And when I think about objectivity and truth and falsity in photography, I tend to think about it in historical terms. So I've got a brief PowerPoint where I want to think about photography and objectivity as an historian might.
And oddly enough, I'm going to start with the present. And I'm going to start with uh, a really important op-ed that Wesley Lowry, African-American journalist here in the United States, and as you can see, the winner of two Pulitzer Prizes, a really important op-ed that he published in the New York Times over, over the summer. You remember the summer was especially difficult here in the United States. There were a series of protests over the brutal killings of African-Americans, especially George Floyd and Breonna Taylor at the hands of the police, these Black Lives Matters protests. And the Black Lives Matter protest raised all kinds of questions about the structure, not only of American society, but of American institutions. And and, and, and showed how white supremacy permeated America's media, America's educational system, America's corporations as much as it did American society as a whole. And here's Lowry thinking about how this notion of objectivity relates to race in the United States. And he starts by looking backwards. He starts by looking backwards at a time when, say, Gordon Parks, the man I'm writing a book about, was active as a journalist and photojournalist, 50 years since the first black journalist appeared in mainstream American newsrooms. And, black, and since that time, he's absolutely right that black journalists have made a few meager demands. Please hire more of us. Please pay us more. Play us as you pay our white colleagues. Please allow us to ascend to leadership roles. Please consider our opinions about accurate and fair coverage of all communities, especially our own. You know, when I was reading this, this op-ed, it struck me how powerfully this resonated with the kinds of things that Gordon Parks was thinking about. Since America's pivot many years ago from an openly partisan press where newspapers were very strongly backing the Republicans or the Democrats. There's been this kind of a profession of objectivity, but he's asking, what does this objectivity mean? And just as 50 or 60 or 70 years ago, when Gordon Parks was active, objectivity was defined by white reporters and white editors. That is to be objective was to see things through white eyes. Those selective troops were also uh, about not offending the sensibilities of white readers. So it was really whiteness in America that was shaping our notions of objectivity. And to step outside of the vision of whiteness was to, by definition, be not objective. Well, this kind of objectivity to see only through white eyes. And I have to say, it's usually middle class or upper class white eyes. There have been real consequences, things that we have not seen. And here he's saying that consequences have been borne particularly by black readers. I think most of you listening to us this morning or this afternoon, wherever you happen to be, could easily say, well, it's not just black readers, is it? It's, it's also Latino readers. It's also very much women readers who have been ill served by this notion of objectivity. It's not just white reporters and editors, but it has been largely white male reporters and editors who have defined objectivity as the way they understand the world. So Lowry is saying, well, ideally, what we would have is a group of journalists, a diverse group of journalists. They have the power to decide who we give platform to, essentially saying that this group of journalists who reflect the diversity of this country would themselves collectively define a sense of objectivity and truth. He's saying this is too often not the case and probably it's rarely the case. Collectively, the industry has responded to generations of black journalists with indifference at best and open hostility at worst. Well, we know that this industry, journalism, has a record of driving black journalists out. And it's an ongoing problem that Lowry also addresses in that op-ed. 
But I couldn't help but think about Gordon Parks. And of course, I think about Gordon Parks every day. I'm writing a book about him. But uh, Parks, in his various memoirs and his various interviews, wrestled with this idea of objectivity. He re referred to it, as you can see here, he referred to the anguish of objectivity. Now, Parks was wrestling alone. Wes Lowry, 2020, has a lot of colleagues that are thinking through these issues with him. Um, he has a body of academic and theoretical work that can question various notions of objectivity. Parks was writing and Parks was working as a photojournalist long before he had any peers in the mainstream press, which is to say in the white press. He was for many years at Life magazine and he was for many years the only uh, African-American on the editorial staff at Life magazine. There also wasn't this academic body of work or theoretical body of work questioning conventional notions of objectivity. So Parks was out there alone, but he was doing work which challenged, which challenged the view of his editors. His editors at Life were overwhelmingly elite white men. They had gone to private schools. They had gone to Ivy League, and, uh, Ivy League universities. They came, many of them, from wealth. And the stories that he's doing are challenging that view. So, you know, he very early on talks about his immersion in, 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 a, in a kind of um, progressive art circles. And he had chosen the camera as a tool of social mobility, but also social consciousness. He wanted to use his camera uh, from the very beginning of his career as a weapon against injustice. And life gives him a platform where he can do that, not without battles with his editors, but he does that, um, starting with this photograph, which I hardly have to explain, which questions the idea of American democracy by, by pairing it with, with symbols of American racism and American um, uh, white supremacy. Uh, he goes to life and does a series of photo essays, which really shape the way that Americans see race. So they're, they're extremely important. Um, this is a visualization of, of Ralph Ellison's great novel, Invisible Man. This is a story on a, ju it's juvenile delinquents. They're not gangs in the 20th, 21st century sense of gangs, but a story on a teenage Harlem gang leader, story on segregation in the South, story on poverty in Brazil and a favela uh, in Brazil, a story on the, uh, what were called then the Black Muslims, the Nation of Islam. Um, he becomes friends with Malcolm X and he's, Parks is also a writer, so he writes about Malcolm X and what Malcolm X means. He's demythologizing Malcolm X for his white audience. He's de-demonizing uh, Malcolm X for his white audience. You can see how life is using him here, how it feels to be black. He was life's spokesperson, sort of token spokesperson on black issues, but he fights, um, very much fights against the, um, the, uh, the pigeonholing that that life has for him, a story on uh, Muhammad Ali, and here he's working with the Black Panthers. And all the time, he's wondering, he's wondering, and what is his place in this magazine? What is his place in American journalism? What is his place in American society? And uh, here, sort of in the middle of his career at life, wondering about his achievements in the white world. Had they cost him objectivity? There's that word, you know, and, but he's not thinking of objectivity as his editors might. He's wondering, have I come so far from the mainstream of black life? Negro was a polite word at that time. Had he come so far from the mainstream of Negro life that he had lost a kind of objectivity. That is to say, had his vision become the vision of the white man's world. He had become completely involved in the white man's world. He's asking himself, whose eyes am I seeing the world through? You know, am I still seeing them through black eyes or am I seeing them through the eyes 
of my editors and my peers, he had almost nobody to talk about this with. <laughs> he was the only African American editorial employee, not simply at Life, but at all the big glossy magazines and major newspapers. You know, he there was no one for him to bounce ideas with who was a peer within the workplace. So he found himself on a plateau of loneliness. Social oddity in the white world, almost a stranger, he's saying here, in the black world. And he's talking here. As I said, he did a lot of memoirs and a lot of interviews. He's looking back. And when he was doing the stories that I just showed you at Life, those stories about race and poverty, and he's saying that my editors weren't sure that I could be as objective as they would like because I was black, because I was black. You know, his editors never asked themselves that as white men, as beneficiaries of patriarchy, can we be objective about gender? They never asked themselves as white men, can we be objective about race? Because of course we are the beneficiaries of white supremacy. We have a vested interest in patriarchy and white supremacy. Can we be objective about it? But no, power sees itself as objective. Power sees itself as neutral. Power has no desire to question those systems and those structures which give them power. So his editors were incapable of asking themselves the question that they asked Gordon Parks. Well, you're black, can you be objective about the black revolution? It's not a question they'd ask themselves. It was a question that Parks heard them ask and deeply resented it. So he's saying, you know, how, how did I figure this out? I mean, I don't want to betray myself. I have to be faithful to my emotions and to his experiences of a black man, as a black man in America. He was a journalist, and a journalist calls on him to be truth to what he sees, but it's also truth to his own beliefs. And here's that phrase, I would have to bear the anguish of objectivity, bear the anguish of objectivity. And so um, this is where he ends up. Um, he was aware that others would follow, ideally others would follow and others have. It's the West Lowry's that he paved the path for. I was about to set a precedent for other blacks who might want to report for the magazine and not just for Life magazine, but for the American media in general. I was also keenly aware of my sympathy for the black movement. That meant that I would become an objective reporter with a subjective heart. So, you know, in his memoirs and his interviews, you can see him wrestling with the very questions that, that we're dealing with 50, 60, and 70 years later. Um, I think he'd be tremendously disappointed that we're still there wrestling, fighting, struggling. But I think he'd be really proud of, of the Black the woman, the Latino journalist um, uh, who are out there fighting still the same fight that he was fighting. So, you know, I tend, like most historians, to want to understand the present by looking at the past. And, you know, when I was invited to take part in this panel, my mind immediately went to what does history show us and tell us? about these questions of objectivity and truth. That's brilliant, John. Thank you so much for that. I, I really love that quote um, and that idea of being an objective reporter with a subjective heart. Uh, that really uh, struck me. So um, I think there's a lot that we can dig into with that. So thank you very much um, for, for your, your introduction there and to the themes. I think that sets us up very well for a discussion. Um, next, I'd like to welcome Jenny Ricketts, and I will introduce uh, Jenny briefly. Um, so with over 30 years of experience, Jenny Ricketts is an independent photography editor, 
curator, consultant, and mentor. For 17 of those years, she was the picture editor at The Observer magazine, commissioning and editing photography, which attracted international recognition and widespread publication. She launched, launched the Jenny Ricketts Gallery in Brighton in 2006 while writing and lecturing and now operates from County Wicklow, County Wicklow, Ireland, um, as an online space representing international photographers. She's currently a trustee for Autograph APB, the Martin Parr Foundation, and a member of the advisory board for Photo Ireland in Dublin. Thanks very much for joining us, Jenny. Thank you, Savannah. Thank you, John. That was, uh, I, don't, I, can't, I don't imagine mine will be anywhere near as um, eloquent as yours, but thank you. And I have no slides, so I'll just um, uh, give uh, an opinion of uh, where I stand on ob objectivity um, and ethics in general in photography. Um, first of all, I, I, would, I would think I would have to restate the fact that objectivity in photography is, is a complete myth because there never is objectivity in photography. It is always, um, any image that we see is always from the point of view of the photographer that's taken that image. Um, and the point of view can be affected by many different things. We all have our unconscious biases. Uh, the question is how we manage them and are, and are we aware of our own unconscious biases? And, um, and how we apply that, how we apply that in the work that's produced. I'm not a photographer. So um, from, from, as, a, as a picture editor's point of, from a picture editor's point of view, I, I do have a better ability to be objective about what I see that's being presented to me. And I do quite often allow myself the space and the time to actually take a step back and look at things and try and ascertain where the photographer is coming from and hopefully get to know a bit about the photographer before I actually make an opinion about the work that I'm looking at. Um, as I say, I can only relate things to in a personal sort of way. Um, uh, for instance, uh, I, I uh, viewed my stepfather's funeral streamed online and a, a while ago, I would have thought that was a completely wrong thing to do. The idea of filming a real funeral and then watching it back online, even photographs at a funeral to me were slightly weird. Growing up, I always thought it was slightly weird. But suddenly, because it was a personal thing and I couldn't get to my family because we, are, we were in lockdown in Ireland, it seemed perfectly acceptable. Um, so ethics change and objectivity can change depending on where you're standing at the time. I always think about, I always think back to um, a, a, a Guardian ad that I saw years ago. I think it was around 1986 that it was actually produced. Um, and it was the Guardian point of view ad. And what we see in the ad is a, a, a man, a thuggish looking character, if you want to call him that, running, suddenly running towards another man who's, who we assume is a business person. He's wearing a suit, he's got a briefcase, doesn't have a bowler hat, but he, he is running towards this man and we assume he is going to mug him because that's the way we're primed and conditioned to understand that kind of situation. But the thing is, when the camera pulls back and shows us more of what's going on in the actual frame, you see that the man in the suit is just passing on below, beneath uh, some scaffolding with a lot of rubble on top. From a building that's being cleared. The, the first guy, the thug, if you like, um, who's running towards him, he can see this from his perspective, so he's running to try and help the man get out of the way. And the man turns at the very, very last minute and sees this person running towards him, and he be, he's immediately defensive. He puts his case up as if to block the man, but then the man grabs him and pulls him out of the way, and we see all the rubble suddenly land on the ground. And for me, that is a, such a brilliant example of how you can misread the situation without actually look, taking a step back and viewing it from a different perspective. Um, when it comes to object, objectivity, again, from my point of view, because I'm not a photographer, first of all, so therefore I'm never the person holding the camera in front of my eye, um, I, I think I do have that luxury of standing back slightly. And I sometimes I forget that I have that luxury, but 
at the, uh, most of the time I can stand back and take a better look at what I'm looking at and then realize that possibly I've read, I can read it in this way or I can read it in that way. But it's my responsibility and it's the responsibility of whoever is editing images to actually do that, to take that time and reflect on what you're looking at and try to understand more about where the photographer is coming from and what that photographer's point of view is. Um, I, uh, recent recent um, images that spring to mind um, that, that for me demonstrate how you can um, get the, the ethics wrong in photography and the rulings on ethics of so the, the, the what we what we probably call the moral orthodoxy um, point of view on photography are for instance Palumi Basu's story on um, Blood Speaks where she was disqualified from a, a, a competition because the she had captioned an image wrong um, and she'd staged the image. Now the question is was the image a lie? I don't think it was because the, the situation happened as it happened what she did was caption it in a way that didn't suit the situation, didn't suit the award that she was applying for. Um, and we have to be able, we're at a point where we have to be able to take a step back and become editors and actually examine that situation properly before we start casting a judgment on it. Because quite often these photographers are in very um, traumatic situations. We know of photographers in the past that have actually uh, taken their own lives because of certain situations and we owe the photographers a responsibility. I'm not casting photographers as heroes at all um, but I do think we owe that they, we've given them that position of becoming the people that report on situations so we owe them the support and um, we have the responsibility to take a step back and allow them to explain themselves before we cast a judgment the institutions that set up competitions and are casting judgments on, on the photographer's work need to take a stronger, stricter rule on how they perform that service. And we, as viewers, need to educate ourselves in how we um, view images and, and before we actually make up our minds about them, take a step back and look at the images properly and understand where the photographers are coming from. Um, I think I'm going to end there because um, I know we've got a lot more to cover and I could actually just bore you to death for, for the rest of the afternoon. It's not boring, Jeannie. It's not boring at all. Thank you. Not at all. That's that's brilliant. So thanks very much. I think there's there's a lot as well in that that we can we can dig into more, I'm sure, as we go through some of the questions that, that we have lined up. Um, I'd just like to remember all, all of the attendees uh, really quickly right now that um, at the bottom of your Zoom panel, you will see a Q&A function. So if you do have any questions that you'd like answered um, during this panel, please feel free to, to post them through that function and we will take them in turn. All right. Thanks very much. Um, and th thank you both very much for, for your opening uh, introductions. I think this really sets us up very well for, for a good discussion. Um, the first question that I uh, have sort of outlined here is uh, quite maybe a simple question, maybe it isn't. Um, I was wondering if you could tell me what is a lie in photography? I feel like maybe that would be a good place to start. John. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jeannie, I'm going to allow you to handle that one first <laughs> and let me think about that. <laughs> we can also uh, skip to the next if, if that's uh, if, if you'd like to. No, I mean, I mean, that's quite hard, isn't it? I mean, there's the obvious lie where I, I can't, I, it's hard to think of an example, but um, there are obvious lies where a photographer or a darkroom person removes something from an image that used to be there. So, for instance, during the Soviet era, after Trotsky um, lost his standing with Stalin and fled into exile, 
uh, Trotsky was taken out of photographs that he had been in through darkroom manipulation. And certainly we know um, notorious examples more recently of people photoshopping elements out of an image that would have changed its meaning or changed the way that people read it. That is a lie, but I think that you're asking for something more subtle than that, aren't you? You know? And so, do you, need, do you have some idea? Because let me think about this and, um, and come back to it. Um, it is problematic. I mean, I mean, if we're talking purely about photojournalism, then a lie, for me, is, is where a, a photographer stages a situation and casts it as something else. Um, to me, that is an obvious lie. But the, the problem that I think we're facing at, in photography generally is that photographers now are all trained and qualified as artists. They're, they're, in fact, most photographers now refer to themselves as artists. And if you give them that mantle, then surely there is freedom of expression that goes with that um, and um, artistic license. So we need to be careful whether we are saying that the photographer is lying or whether they're giving their impression of a situation. Um, there is, I think there is a subtle difference. There's a very subtle difference. Um, it depends whether you're reporting on a factual situation or whether you're giving an impression of a factual situation. Uh, to me, um, documentary photography, for instance, um, is a brilliant art form, I think. Um, and within documentary photographer, photography, um, the artists can tell the story in whatever fashion they choose, surely, because that's the nature of telling stories. You know, writers do it all the time. You change the linearity, you, change, you move things around, you, you just manufacture how you want to present that story. But it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a lie. It's just the way you've told it. Um, again, going back to personal issues, um, I, I, I think I mentioned earlier that my mother and myself, we, we speak every day on the phone because I can't get to England. And I will quite often bring, mention a story from the past that I seem to have very clearly in my head as happening one way. But my mother will say to me, well, that didn't happen like that. What? How? You know, and I think to myself, well, am I lying? Did I just make that all up completely? And it's not that I've made it up or it's not that I'm, I'm lying or she's lying. It's just that we have completely different points of view. And we have a memory of that situation that is completely different. So that's my explanation. Yeah. You know, this makes me think of um, a blog post I wrote many years ago when we were all blogging. And I wrote about two photographs that Dorothea Lang made back in the 1930s. Dorothea Lang is, of course, the famous American photographer who was working for a government agency called the Farm Security Administration. And at the time, her, her job was to document the lives of migrant farm workers. And so she was out in California and basically on the road and looking for opportunities on farms, on the road, in camps where people stayed to to document their lives. And there are two very striking photographs of a young mother and a child. Uh, the photograph that's most often seen is this young mother sitting in the passenger seat of a pickup truck, 1930s pickup truck, of course. And it's clear that both mother and child are haggard. They've been on the road for God knows how long. They have either lost their jobs, perhaps lost their farm, uh, perhaps working as farm laborers for a pittance. Their clothes are a bit ragged, their faces are dirty, but they just look tired, really tired and worn, and, 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 and probably hadn't had a good bath or shower in a week or more. So it looks like a picture of migrant workers that are sort of typical of America during the Great Depression of the 1930s, and they're typical of the of the images that um, that the Farm Security Administration is most famous for having made. And 
they were not aimed, of course, at an audience of farm workers. They were aimed at a middle class or an affluent audience. And this affluent audience was invited to feel empathy, uh, sorry for the people in the photograph, and to want to reach out and help them. And uh, not reach out and help them perhaps personally, but reach out and help them through government work. There's another photograph that Lang made at almost the same moment of this mother and child. And she made it after the father had come up and said, what are you doing? And she said, well, I work for the government and I'm taking pictures of farm workers. And he said, well, I don't want you to take pictures of my family looking like that. And so he goes back into the gas station. They're parked out in front of a gas station and he gets a rag and he gets some water and he cleans off his child's face and the mother kind of does herself up. And then Dorothy Lang makes another picture of this mother and child. And both the mother and the child are smiling for the camera. And instead of looking haggard, they're kind of looking bright and alert, you know? And, you know, they look happy <laughs> and they're smiling. And, they, and they, they don't look like people you need to pity anymore. But it's more than just they don't look like people you need to pity. They look like people who are capable of helping themselves, right? They are capable of doing something for themselves. This second picture is not an invitation to go in and save these people. This second picture is an invitation of what can we do to help them doing what they're already doing, right? How can we you know, sort of give them a boost on their way, right? It, it, it's um, not an image of people who are without agency, without the capability of helping themselves. It's a picture of people who are fully in possession of their, their agency, their capability of changing their condition. They're fully um, in possession of their dignity. And it's a reminder that you may be poor, you may be haggard, you may be a migrant farm worker, but you still love your family, you still tell jokes, you still have fun, you know, it's a completely different image of what it means to be poor, right? Mm -hmm. And what it means to be down and out. And, you know, the first image is not a lie. When Dorothea Lang first saw this mother and this child, they were dirty and haggard and bone tired. But that's not all that they were. And the husband who came out and said, what are you doing taking these pictures, understood that that's not all that they were, you know, and all they needed to do was wash their faces and comb their hair. And all of a sudden, you get this very different view, right? And, you know, so which is the truth and which is the lie, right? So, there is a truth that being a migrant farm worker is a very hard life and you're likely, but there's also the truth that this is not all that people are. Even when they're tired and haggard, they're much more than that. And if we only see them in one way, then we think we need to come in and be their savior, where in fact, they're fully capable of helping themselves. If maybe we just change the system a little bit, so they can do that, right? So, you know, what do you want to do? Well, why don't we change some of these anti-labor laws? Why don't we change some of these anti-union laws? Why don't we enable them to self-organize as members of a farm workers union to fight to better their condition? Hey, the second, the second photograph allows us to imagine that rather than being saviors from the outside. Can I just add there into the equation that uh, the, the thing that we probably quite often forget is that most media is some sort of business who, whose aim is to make money. So therefore, yeah. the more sensational the image, um, the better it works for the media. So, yeah. uh, and also, if you look at most of what we see in the media in the past and right up to today, if you look at it in terms of it being propaganda, then it makes it makes better sense to understand that 
that's yeah. those are the types of messages that certain people would like to propagate and like to maintain it is about the media is about making money so the that's the exactly right and yeah i'm sorry my I, i've got very weak wi-fi at the moment and so um, your, your Jeannie, phone you were, keeps freezing john yeah you were going in and out and i apologize for that but it's sometimes your wi-fi doesn't want to cooperate with you i do want to say that you're exactly right to ask for whom was the photo made? And you know, Dorothea Lang is working for a government agency, and it's a government agency that is set up to help migrant laborers. So the first photograph, which shows migrant laborers desperately needing help, is the kind of photograph that the photo agent, sorry, that the government agency wanted. You know, it wanted to justify its existence, and it justifies its existence by showing that there are people who need them, right? So the first photograph is going to work in the way that the second photograph is not. The first photograph showing the very tired and haggard mother and child also works in maintaining the status quo, right? So that a, 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 new, a newspaper or a magazine commercial publication in the United States would have been very happy probably with that first um, photo because, as I was saying, it invites a kind of middle class or affluent saviorism, whereas the second photograph might challenge the status quo. And, you know, mainstream press is generally not interested in challenging the fundamental structures of society, of empowering the poor, of empowering the marginalized right and so the second photograph which invites you to imagine empowering migrant laborers to challenge their bosses this is something that most newspapers and magazines don't really want because they're so deeply embedded in the status quo and the way things are i agree with that totally yeah all right, that is all really brilliant. We have a lot of questions coming for, through. So I'm sure, uh, please do keep putting your questions. I'm sure we won't get to all of them though, because uh, there, there's quite a lot to cover. But um, going off of um, the idea of a lie and intention, and you've sort of already touched on this. Um, I think you both have already touched on this a bit, but Simone was asking, um, how much does intention matter? when we're thinking about um, whether a photograph is a lie. Um, she asks, is a lie through an image also to do with the intention of making and using the image? And she gave an example of an image from um, either Syria or Yemen of a child photographed next to a grave. And the intention of the image maker was not a lie, but then the image was then used in a dishonest context. So I guess maybe if you could elaborate a little bit more about the, the importance of context and intention uh, and usage, I guess, in this, in this conversation. Shall I go first? Um, sure. Um, this comes back to my point about having responsibility as editors and um, even as viewers, because um, uh, it, using images in a way that they weren't necessarily intended is part of the problem. Um, and quite often the photographer has very little to do with that. You know, once an image um, lands on a picture desk, for instance, um, it's up to the editorial um, within that newspaper, that publication, how they use it, you know, and the photographer may or may not know what that is. So uh, the intention is important um, and it is a problem, again, which is uh, something that we need to address. How, how picture desks and picture editors are taught to regard the work of others. You know, I've, I've seen this on several occasions where an image was cropped completely um, away from its original intention and used in a way that the photographer probably never intended, um, both in terms of a piece of art um, and then also uh, uh, news images. Um, and these are things that the general public probably have no idea about because you wouldn't, why would they? They're, they're not within the newspaper offices or the magazine offices, um, but it is something that the industry needs to be 
be more careful about and probably by now should be educating all picture desks and people involved with editing photography that it's their responsibility to make sure they're using things for the right purposes yeah yeah um you know i'm tempted to say that intention doesn't matter at all um, not in documentary and photojournalism uh, i think the way that a photographer behaves out in the field i mean how do you treat the people that you're working with do you see them as subjects or do you see them as partners and collaborators that matters a lot but as Jeannie said, that once the photograph is made, um, it's in some ways out of the photographer's hand, right? It goes to the editor, you know, but it also goes to the viewer, right? So that we know that editors can do what they want to with the photograph. And this is something that Gordon Parks worried about a lot working with life because life's photographers, they didn't even develop their own film, let alone, you know, choose the photographs that go into the photo essay or lay out the photo essay or juxtapose photographs in the photo essay that was done by editors and layout artists and so it's out of his hands but even if parks had been directly engaged in developing and printing his images in selecting which images go into the magazine had been involved in the layout of his photo essays the magazine still gets printed and then it's in the hands of the viewer. And we know that photographs are these slippery, slippery things. I mean, my favorite cliche is that analyzing a photograph, interpreting a photograph is like nailing jelly to the wall, you know, <laughs> that uh, the viewer is free to do whatever she wants to with the photograph. And so intention is so far distant by the time that it gets to the eyes of the viewer you know, so, so far distant. I think it might be different if we're talking about fine art photography and the photographer has control over even how it's displayed in a gallery, but that's not true for photojournalists and documentary photographers, at least 99.9% .9 of the time. So intentionality, we hope that people have good intentions, but by the time a viewer sees it, Boy, those intentions are just way mm. distant <laughs> in the past. Yeah. Um, going going off of that a wee bit, I'm trying to bring in these questions in a order that makes sense. And I see that um, uh, Nani has asked here, what happens with ethics over time when documentary and photojournalistic photojournalistic works are revisited um, years later, and particularly when they go into a gallery? Could you tell us maybe a little bit about that? Well, I'll start then. Um, ethics change. <laughs> they absolutely change over time. You know, in, when documentary photography, um, or what we call documentary photography, emerges in the uh, middle of the 19th century, there are no ethics, right? They're inventing it as they go. There isn't a code of ethics. Nobody has put one together yet. You know, photographers are you know, it's trial and error, it's touch and feel, it's like, we're just gonna do it. And, you know, it's not until the 20th century that ethics are codified in any particular way. And they're initially codified within the mainstream press by editors and photographers who are overwhelmingly white and male. I know this, that's the first, that's the origins of ethics, at least in the United States, right? But this summer, we definitely saw how ethics can be challenged and changed in real time. I mean, there was a fierce debate over photo ethics. And, you know, one of the flashpoints was, do we show the faces of people who are participating in Black Lives Matter protests? And of course, there were many, many photojournalists that say, well, of course we do. I mean, they're, they're out in public. They're showing their faces. We have no obligation to these people. We're going to do things the way that we always did it. But there were other voices, especially coming from photographers of color and women, and I have to say younger photographers, 
who were very aware of the potential for surveillance and how their images could be used by the police and by the state as tools of repression, as ways of identifying protesters and going to get them, and people who are expressing their constitutional rights, but nevertheless, they could be used as a form of repression. And we know that this has happened elsewhere. Well, it's happened in the United States a lot. Uh, it's happened in the past in the United States. So I don't have to give the example of South Africa or Eastern Europe or authoritarian regimes around the world. No, I can simply give the example of the United States where media photography has been used by the police and by the state uh, to identify people who are simply expressing their constitutional right to demand change and to protest, uh, but nevertheless uh, have, you know, these press photographs, media photographs have been used as instruments of repression. And so there was a fierce debate this last summer within the photographic world over that. Um, so ethics are changing in real time where it's visible, right? I think that they change slowly, generally, but a lot of things changed quickly in 2020. And I think that that is one of the things. And I suspect that the ethical stance of no, you can't simply show all faces you know, you have to be aware of whether or not you have permission. Sometimes it's just silent permission. You can tell whether somebody wants to be photographed or not. Um, and you have to be aware of the potential that your photographs might be used as instruments of repression and surveillance. I agree. I agree. Um, and also, I would just, I would add that ethics really are, are subjective and they're constantly changing like language, you know, it's constantly changing. Um, and when it comes to historical imagery, I mean, we've seen, we're, we're witnessing the, the situation with Magnum photos at the moment where certain images are being pulled out of their archives and, um, you know, questions being asked about them and, and quite rightly so. Um, and I think we have to, again, it's, it's like with educating the photo editing staff um, and also educa educating the, the viewer, we, we've got to a point where we have to start going back through archives, looking at what exists there and having them marked as either censored or restricted or whatever. Um, but this needs to be done and it needs to be done urgently because I'm sure there are many, many images in, within archives throughout the world that would offend people now if they saw them but didn't offend anyone at the time that they were produced 10, 20, 30 years ago. So we, it, 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 it's a movable, movable thing. Um, ethics is, are a movable thing and they're, they're constantly changing, evolving, getting better or getting worse. I don't know, however you want to term it, but we do need to examine them and we need to go back and examine the images that exist and make sure that what is available to be seen by the general public fits in with the times that we're, 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 we're living in. This, this conversation reminds me a little bit of the work of um, Elizabeth Edwards as well, who really- Yeah, I, I want to- Go for it, yeah. No, I was just going to say, and I know my Wi-Fi is going in and out and I really apologize for that. Um, what Jeannie just said, I think links back to that Wes Lowry op-ed that I began with today, where, you know, one of the reasons why the, we're rethinking ethics and one of the reasons why some of the Magnum photographs, especially of children who are being abused, um, and I have to say non-white children who are being abused, one of the reasons that we're questioning these things is of the new voices who are in the profession, right? And so we now have, you know, people who are engaging in these debates and people who are making their views known, who are 
of African, Asian, Latin American descent. Uh, we have women, we have non-binary people, we have trans people, we have gay and lesbian people. We have all kinds of people who are now part of the community who are shaping our view of things. And that's way different from the way that it was, mm. let me just say 30 years ago and probably 20 years ago mm. where these voices are now so visible and they're not alone, they're not locally, right? And, and um, so, you know, ethics are changing in part because who's part of the photographic community now? And, or who has a voice in the photographic community now? Who has power, some power, some say in the photographic community? And I think that that is the kind of change that Wes Lowry was calling for in newsrooms. We're seeing that more broadly um, even in the world of, of, of freelancing photographers. Absolutely. Um, and yeah, I think, I think with regard as well to what Jenny was saying um, a minute ago, it, it did also remind me of the work of um, Elizabeth Edwards and how she uh, sort of started this work, I guess, in the 90s, um, looking at sort of colonial photographs and recontextualizing them to study the practices of colonialism, you know, so I think that we can also maybe there's a discussion to be had about turning photographs on their head as well and using them sort of against maybe the more power structures that be at different mm. times. Um, I don't know if that sounds relevant or appropriate to either of you if you want to comment on that before we move on to the next question or not. Well, I think it's certainly true. <laughs> There's no question about that. Um, and it depends on which photographs we are looking at, right? So um, to use the Magnum example that we would never um, display those images of children who are being abused. I mean, that's, you know, they are, should not be seen. Um, even I think in an academic context, but there are certainly other kinds of photographs, you know, in the case of colonialism, images that were made at the behest of colonial administrators or early ethnographers to demonstrate that the inferiority of the colon colonial subject, yeah, those can be used carefully, <laughs> very, very, very carefully, right? Um, in the right kind of setting and context. But even so, boy, I mean, you have to be so aware that these images can slip out of whatever context you try to create for them. And people are perfectly capable of looking at a photo that was made, say, in the 1890s in the service of colonialism that's about depicting the colonial subject as irredeemably backward and irredeemably exotic and inferior, people today are cap perfectly capable of looking at that and saying, wow, that's pretty cool. How exotic is that? And <laughs> so, yeah, you can use those photographs, but man, <laughs> photo photo photographs are unruly, you know? They will not be tamed. That's a very good point. Um, but the important thing is to be able to use them and discuss the situation surely um otherwise how do we progress how do we move on from a bad situation um, yeah i'm not saying don't use them i mean i i use them in my teaching all the time yeah. right um and i think it's important to know how photography was used yeah. um in order to in order to demonstrate mm -hmm. um, the scientific inferiority of colonial subjects, of African Americans, of working class people, photography has been used in that way a lot. And we yeah. have to recognize that. It's been a tool of repression as much as it's been a tool of liberation. Mm -hmm. So yes, we have to see these things within limits. Um, uh, like I said, no child abuse, but um, we have to see these photographs. We have to discuss these photographs. We have to be aware of them. But we also have to be aware of their potential not to be viewed as we're trying to contextualize them. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, going off uh, as well, um, Charlotte has raised a question that uh, I'm very uh, interested in and passionate about 
Um, and I realize I, I don't want to veer us too far off the topic of, of objectivity. I think we're getting more into the muddy waters of, of ethics across the board, but I suppose it is all relevant. Um, but I do, I do want to um, flag this question that, that Charlotte raised, um, which is that people will always make mistakes concerning ethics in their photography, but how should we treat each other when this happens and how should we proceed from there? It's a great question. Mm. Well, I think I already, I've already um, made reference to that by saying that we, we have a responsibility to support and help people under, photographers, artists understand why something is right or wrong or why we, it is viewed as right, right or wrong or, or why it can. I mean, uh, even this morning I had, uh, I had a, an email discussion about the title of a, a photo story um, and we, uh, some of us were, were questioning whether the title was a good one um, because it was it kind of placed a value on the, the people within the images um, and if, if we don't if we aren't able to surely we've reached a, a level of maturity I think we're at a tipping point now where we are either at that level of maturity where we can all sit down and say look we need to discuss this is this is this okay to do this or should we do it in a different way or can we do it in a different way um or we can just simply sit back and allow chaos to 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 continue um for eternity you know and ne none of us ever agreeing on anything you know and no progress being made the only way we're going to keep moving forward is by being able to pick up these things when we see them and and sit around and talk about them um and hopefully come to agreements about them. But I think we do have a, uh, collectively have a responsibility for all of yeah. this. Yeah. No? <laughs> yeah, um, you know, how do you treat people who make mistakes? And I'm going to pause for a second to let my, int my Wi-Fi catch up with me. But how do we treat people who make mistakes? Yeah, we all make mistakes. Boy, I've made some tremendous mistakes. And I've made mistakes on social media. And I think that social media is where we have these conversations now. And I think that it's too bad that that's where we have these conversations. It is the forum where we can gather the most people, right? You know, that um, even on a Zoom meeting like this, we're not gathering you know, many people not compared to the number of photographers in the world, the number of people who are engaged in these conversations. But on social media, we can, and yet social media, I think, sometimes brings out the worst in us. And it's hard to, um, you know, you asked the question, how should we treat people who make mistakes? And my, my first answer was going to be with compassion. Right, Absolutely. but social media does not encourage compassion. It does not encourage, you know, uh, reflection. It does not encourage, you know, sort of deep thought, mm -hmm. and it does encourage, you know, emotion and sort of spontaneous combustion. On, and I've I regret that I have participated in some of the uglier sides of mm -hmm. uh, of social media. Um, you know, uh, I agree. I do too. Yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. You know that that I think that in most cases that people who make mistakes have, you know, earned at least a certain amount of empathy from us. Um, there are really egregious cases where, you know, there has been malicious intent but where you don't see malicious intent, then I think a certain amount of empathy is called for. I, I think um, this is something that's really uh, at the heart of, of what I try to do. I think with the Photography Ethics Center, it's something I'm really passionate about. Um, and I'm glad this, the question was raised. I think that, yeah, um, I know the, that I'm not on the panel, but I do want to chime in if you don't, if, if I have your permission to, <laughs> to chime in on that one. Um, but I, I do think that there's, you know, we have a responsibility to, to each other and to photography to, to call things out. Um, I think we have a responsibility to do that with compassion, as you said. And I think that we also 
have a responsibility to respond to things with vulnerability. I've written a little bit about this. I, I do think that there's an element of vulnerability in recognizing, you know, it's easier though to respond to something with vulnerability if you're approached with compassion. If you're approached on the attack, it's much easier to be defensive. And so I think that it, there's this negotiation there um, that I feel like I've witnessed um, a bit from, from my position. And uh, I do think that both are needed. And I think that that sort of response maybe I see T has popped a question in there about um, apology and how you know a lack of apology can cause more harm. And I think I think it I think it's a, a relationship issue. And I don't know if either of you want to want to comment on that. But I, I do I feel a very strong need that we do that we treat each other with respect. I think respect of our colleagues is as much of an ethical issue as respect of the people that we're photographing. Um, and obviously vulnerability is much easier when you're being respected. But I, yeah, I don't, sorry to, to chime in there, but I, I did want to add that. No, I think you're absolutely right. Um, uh, and, and I do think that um, it's, it's, it's better to be, allow people to make mistakes. People have to make mistakes. Um, if we don't make mistakes, then we'll probably never learn anything. But the, the important thing is to actually sit and discuss it so that we, we do educate ourselves and learn from whatever the mistake is or was. Um, you know, humans, human beings are, are, are fallible, you know, and it, it doesn't make you a, a bad or an evil person because you've made a mistake, you know. Um, I, I suppose what, what is, is more difficult is, rec is being able to realize when somebody's intentionally doing something wrong um, and then claiming that it was a mistake. But at the same time, you have to give them the benefit of the doubt and give them an opportunity to redeem themselves in some way. I do, um, when, at the subject of apology, um, I think apologies need to, to be made as soon as possible if it's accepted that it was a mistake. If the person who's made the mistake accepts that it's a mistake, then I think they should apologize. But also, I think that any... Um, um, uh, situations that arise need to be dealt with immediately um, because a sore will fester if you leave it for too long, you know. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, apology is not something that, you know, I think I would expect or ask for in a personal sense. But apology, in a more general way, is at least a sign that somebody has taken the critique to heart, right? That, that a, it's a sign that the critique has been understood. It's a sign that the critique has been internalized, mm -hmm. right? And it's a, a kind of a pledge to not do this again. And so that I think that when really severe mistakes happen, then, you know, some sort of apology to the community as a whole might be called for, right? But um, that's, uh, it's not something I would be in a position to ask somebody to do. Um, and, and going off of uh, what you had said earlier, John, about how, you know, we can only we can only gather so many people in a space like this, um, especially with me manning manning the keyboard here and trying to <laughs> keep up with all the comments as well. So I do apologize if uh, if your your comment doesn't get responded to. It is only me. Um, but uh, I did want to raise this question from Kiara about or uh, or Kira, sorry, um, about um, is there anything so. I wonder if you have any thoughts or lessons about how we can reach a wider audience and a more mainstream audience. Um, well, is there anything that academic students and independents can do to catalyze these conversations in the spaces and with the people who are not having these debates and um, who she would argue really needs, really needs them and needs to engage with them? Well, one thing I'm doing is uh, organizing a symposium for Bristol Photo Festival um, next year. And I think it is at venues like that or, or events like that where the general public can be brought in um, because they are open festivals. I mean, oh, yes, you have to buy a ticket to go along, but um, I think that, that those are the, the types of opportunities that come up um, where the general public can be invited in and to sit and listen to 
you know, panels like this, for instance, um, at the, a panel like this at the moment is just being broadcast to a select group of people who have chosen to be here at this moment in time. Whereas if you put it out into, into a, a, more, a more broader venue, like a symposium of some kind, um, where an advertising promote it properly, um, the general public are more likely to, to walk through the door and sit and listen for a while. Um, other than that, you know, just through the general media, I suppose, but um, we, we do need now to start actually getting the public to engage with these types of discussions, um, whether it's through the television or the radio, I don't know, but we do need to, I think so, because at the moment it seems to me that these conversations are being had within the pho pho photography community, and that's not enough. It needs to be broader than that. Um, I've, I've discovered, I've, what I've realized through social media is that um, we are, I'm just talking to people who are already converted most of the time. And I'd rather not do that. I'd rather be speaking to the person on the street who, who might have a, a camera on their phone um, or might be vaguely interested in photography. Um, but if I stand and talk to them, then they'll listen to me because I have had, had situations like that where I've met total strangers who are not photographers um, but I would start talking about photography or something that I can see on a wall in a gallery or something um, and, and people are interested um, but you have to find a way to engage them um, and I think we're not doing that enough at the moment. Yeah, yeah uh, the first thing we have to acknowledge is that photography will remain niche, right? Most people are not that interested in the nuts and bolts of photography. They like looking at it, but they're not all that interested in, um, in, in, in talking about it. And I, I wish that were not true um, in my own teaching. I don't necessarily want my students to come out with a deep knowledge of photo history, but I want them to be visually literate. That's actually my most important goal is to get them to understand that when you see a photograph, you should stop and read it in the same kind of way that you might read a newspaper article, if that's appropriate, or a poem, if that's appropriate. That, you know, this needs to be read and understood, not simply taken in and taken for granted. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, visual literacy is not something that most people are taught in school and so i try to do that in teaching photo history and i have to say like i said um, visual literacy is a more important goal to me um, in my teaching than the details of the history of photography mm. but Jeannie's right i mean there are ways of getting people engaged right and so uh, you know one of the projects that i'm working on right now is using studio portrait photography of the African-American community of this town I live in, Charlottesville, Virginia, and the surrounding area of using portraits to tell a history of this place that has not been told before, a history of this place that has been marginalized. Uh, you know, these portraits that are 100, 120, 130 years old, invite us into the world of the people in the portraits. They're presenting themselves in the camera as they wish to be seen. They are in contradiction to the cliches and stereotypes of a racist American visual culture at the time. They show people with dignity. They show people with pride. They show people with family affection and joy of style, of grace, all these things that were in contemporary American culture that were denied to African Americans. Now these were studio portraits and they were meant to be private. Mm -hmm. uh, we are taking them out into the world, literally outdoors um, and also indoors and also online. And we're using them as a, as, as a, not literal, not, the window is actually the wrong metaphor, but, you know, they are invitations into imagining this other history, and we will surround them with some words, we'll tell you who you're looking at, what they did, where they lived, etc., and so on. But that's another way of thinking about photo ethics, right? And, you know, it's, on the one hand, thinking about a world of photography, which was unseen at the time, 
which we're seeing now, which tells us how this African American community and all over the country, and we know also all over the world, is that people from marginalized communities were using photography in this way to create images of themselves that showed them as they wished to be seen, as they saw themselves, as they wanted to be seen. But there is an ethic, ethical questions involved in taking what had been private and taking them out into the public. Because there were images that were made to be on people's mantelpiece, on displayed in the home, displayed in photo albums, they were not meant to be seen in public and they were not meant to be seen by strangers. And so we are sensitive to that, right? And we talk about, you know, how we wrestle with this question. And, you know, one of the most obvious ways we wrestle with it is we, we look for descendants <laughs> and we say, is this okay with you, you know, for us to be using these images in this way? And, you know, we've, had a, a really strong popular response, especially to our outdoor exhibitions, so that we can, you know, get people engaged with the images themselves and then either in our forums or talks or online, they can see us grappling with these mm -hmm. kind of ethical issues. But, you know, that's still a small audience, right? Um, and I think that one of the things that we have to ask ourselves if we want more people involved in these questions and we want them involved in places that allow for reflection, um, so not in social media, what platform, what platform is there? You know, a Zoom meeting is never going to have more than a couple hundred people at best that are, that are there. I regret the loss of the New York Times Lens blog. The New York Times Lens blog, because of its platform, reached a large audience and it wasn't just the usual suspects, right? So that it, Lens blog displayed photography very well. So you might get upwards of 15 images sometimes to look at a body of work, a particular photographer, a particular school of photography, a particular issue being photographed. So you've got a significant number of images and then 800, 900 words for somebody to write about it and reflect on it. There wasn't a whole lot of back and forth, even though there were comments underneath the articles, but still it was a platform that reached rather than a few hundred people, um, tens of thousands of people, and sometimes hundreds of thousands of people would see that. And the demise of the lens blog, I think, was a blow to the photographic community in ways that we didn't understand at the time and we haven't fully taken on board because there's frankly nothing like it, right? There's nothing like it. And I wish there were. But you need a platform. You know, it needs to be a New York Times or a Guardian or a Le Monde, you know, that does this. It has to be a platform with a reach already, with an audience already. Mm -hmm. well, I agree. Um, on that uh, point that you were describing about sort of the studio portraits, I found that really um, an interesting point. It reminded me a lot of, uh, I mean, you may have mentioned Tina Camp's work. I was also scrolling through questions at the same time, so apologies. Um, but I think her work looks quite a lot at that and this idea of how people present themselves and um, the importance of understanding the relationships that take place when a photograph is taken, right? What are people's motivations for, ha for sitting for a camera and what are people's motivations for um, clicking the shutter? Um, and so I guess on the, the, that line, I kind of wanted to maybe turn us a little bit back to the theme of objectivity and ask you if it's um, ever okay for a photographer to lie to the viewer. And I think this also sort of gets at that question that Jenny raised earlier, which I think is a really important question that I don't think we've interrogated enough or thought enough about is this question between like, how do we as photographers also identify ourselves as artists, as um, photojournalists, and, and how does that relate to, to the image making process and this idea of objectivity and truth telling? Sorry, that was a very long question. <laughs> 
John, I think you should start. <laughs> oh, gosh. Look, I'm not a photographer. I don't think of myself as a photographer, right? Um, even though I've worked on two long-term projects and have published a book on photography, I still don't think of myself as a photographer. Um, and, but I was conscious about, you know, how I presented myself to the people I was working with. So, you know, when I did this long eight or nine year project on American, um, American car culture, especially drag racing, it's been recently published at least last summer in Bitter Southerner. Um, people would ask me what I was doing. I said, you know, at the beginning, I was just having fun. You know, I really was. I was looking for something to do um, in my spare time. And I was looking for a community to be part of. And I said, I'm just having fun. And when I started posting the photographs on my blog, um, I, I started saying that. I, I'm posting these photographs on my blog. And, you know, we didn't have smartphones when I started. So I couldn't whip out my phone and show them the blog. But I always gave people the address. And, um, and then eventually it became, well, you know, I would like to exhibit these. And I would like to publish them as a book. And, you know, and... That's always a dangerous thing to say because people are now asking, what, is that book ever going to show up? And I have to tell them, no, this particular book is not ever going to show up. But, um, you know, um, there are always, you know, look, when I was hanging out in drag strips, there were plenty of questions about me. I mean, what's this middle-aged college professor doing hanging out at the drag strip, right? So, you know, I knew that people wanted to know. And eventually... I made lots and lots of friends out there, so they got to know me. And it was a similar thing with the working with the Cape Town Carnival troops that I did. That's the that did turn into a book on um, the Cape Town Carnival, and but it was also this process, right? So I'm not working for anybody, you know. This is for me. And first two years, I was a member of a carnival troupe, and I was marching with them during carnival and going to the rehearsals and the practices and all this. It's why are you doing this? It's because it's fun. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and this was still before everybody had smartphones. So I would get um, four by six, uh, you know, little prints made at the uh, photo finisher and take them back and everybody gets a picture and this, that, and the other. And then after two years, it became I'm thinking about turning this into a book, but then you say that, yeah, I'm thinking about turning this into a book. You got any problems with that? No, nah, that's not what I said. What I said, is that okay with you? And um, that was okay with everybody. You know, this was another marginalized community that always been looked down on. And here was this American professor who was taking them seriously and having fun with them and making a fool of himself uh, at times because it's carnival. Um, you know, uh, these were all self-funded projects and my income never depended on them. So I was, you know, I was making photographs in a way that um, were different from most of the people who are on the Zoom call right now, right? And so, you know, um, I can't say much more about that except that you know, I was, even without the language at the time, I don't think I had the language about thinking about the people I was working with as collaborators. Um, but I did have the language about thinking of them as friends and always being sensitive to, you know, who wants their picture made and who doesn't, you know, that's always clear in any setting. Um, you know, if I hadn't been open really open and transparent about who I was and what my motives were, I couldn't have gotten the images that I got. There would have been suspicion because in both settings, I'm quite an outsider in a, in a variety of different ways. And um, yeah, that's not answering the question as the I'm going to say, I, I, I have to admit, I've, I've lost track of what the question was. <laughs> but, um, um, the thing I would say, 
maybe in relation to what John's just been talking about there, is, the, is that there is a tremendous power in positivity and the power of photography uh, is that it can help us to promote the right sort of images of people. Um, and, and people are not going to be offended if you promote them in the right way. I mean, I, I've just been reading up on um, Tom Burrell, I think, the advertising, black US advertising executive there, um, who was the first black executive, uh, advertising executive in the States. Um, and he, he makes this point that there is huge power in positivity. Um, and if you give, if you portray people in the right way, or you, you photograph them in the right way, and it, this probably relates back to the Dorothea Lang image that you mentioned, the, the two different uh, images of the, the family. Um, uh, you know, if you, if you portray them in the right way, then, you know, people are not going to be offended. It's only if you portray them in, in a bad way that they'll be offended. Um, and when you're likely to get into trouble and, and, and affects the ethics of what you're doing. The ethics are only questionable when you're doing something that is giving people a bad image rather than a good image. I, I think yeah. on, on that point... Yeah, let, let me jump on that for a second, Savannah. And yeah. it, Jeannie mentioned power, and that's a word I haven't actually spoken today, and I should speak that word power. One thing that being immersed in the history of photography prepared me for when I worked on these two long-term projects was to be aware of power and be aware of power relationships and to be aware of my own power so that, yeah, I'm African-American, but I'm affluent. I'm a college professor. I have access to media. I can dream about getting published and exhibited and I can put things on a blog. Um, I was aware of how class and status gave me power in both of these situations. And especially in South Africa, where I was working with very working class people uh, and, and people who were even poorer than working class. And, but not only that, I was an American. I had the money to fly over to South Africa on a regular basis to participate in this. You know, I had this expensive camera. I could go to the photo finisher and have all these four by six prints made so I could give them away. That's, that's power. That's, and so, you know, one of the things that that awareness of power meant was that I tried to walk as softly as I could, right? I tried to be as self-aware as I could. Um, inevitably, I stepped on people's toes, and inevitably, sometimes people were offended by what I did. But I tried to keep that as minimum as I as I could. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that power is a word I wish I, you know, had been brought up earlier in this conversation, because I think that the camera you know, gives power, confers power, and access to publication and media confers power. And that's definitely something that, you know, we always, 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 always need to carry yeah. with us. I agree. Absolutely. And, and um, as Nancy has mentioned as well in the comments, I see, you know, talking about the power of holding the camera and being the one who also uh, presses the shutter and dictates what's, you know, what, the world sees afterwards, I think, um, comes into that. And I think that that example of Dorothea Lang is, um, made me think of the uh, TED talk um, by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie on the danger of a single story, which I think that probably many people um, are aware of. And it, I think that, that just really struck me that, you know, we do, it, isolating things in different moments tells a completely different story. And what is our responsibility in that, I guess, as photographers? Because like you're saying, like neither one is wrong or a lie. Um, both are true. There are many truths that we could photograph and many versions of, you know, a, an individual that, that can be highlighted. How do we reconcile that when, when we're holding a camera, we are forced to isolate a moment in time uh, in some way 
do you reckon that as I think Craig asked, you know, um, through having a photo essay instead of a single image, or are there other ways that we can um, reckon that in our work as photographers? Can I just get back to Dorothea Lang for a second? Yeah, for sure. So, Dorothea Lang actually made several photographs of the haggard mother, and then after she and her child had washed their faces. We know for a fact that there are many photographers who would not have made the picture of them once they had washed their faces. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of photographers who would have said, nah, that's not what I want to show, you know? They would have said, no, the reality is the haggard and dirty. I'm not going to make that picture. Or, hey, that's the husband is, to be. Yeah. Or the husband has intruded here and he's manipulated the situation. They would have found some reason not to make that picture of them cleaned up and looking happy, right? They, they would have, you know, that at the time in the 30s and now today in December 2020, there are plenty of photographers who would not have made that other photo. Because, John, you it's, have the money to. Shot. it's about the money shot, isn't it? They know, yeah, well, psychologically, they know which images are going to have the greatest impact and the most powerful, and that will become iconic. So, therefore, yeah. they sure, instinctively but... will go for that image and forget sure. about that. And once they have yeah. that, forget about that. But the, the question is, what is the photographer's responsibility? And the photographer's responsibility is to do as Dorothea Lang did is to make that other shot, is to give yeah. us that other context, which may not have gotten published at the time, yeah. but it's in the archive. It's in the archive. It's in the archive, and we've got it now. And we yeah. can talk about it, and we can show it now. And I use that image in class about this particular conversation. What is the truth, right? You know, is is either one of these photographs truer than the other? Is one more of a lie than the other? I don't think so. I think we need both, right? And ideally, we need it in a also a much larger context that helps us understand the plight of migrant farm workers during this calamitous time in American history. And we have to know how the social and economic structure of American uh, of, of the United States in the 1930s helped to create poverty rather than to alleviate it. We need that entire context. Photographer can't do all of that, right? Mm -hmm. But a photographer can make both of those pictures. And so if you're talking about what should a photographer do, is to man, be aware of this, to have grappled with these issues, to have this in the front of your mind, and to know that you can't control what an editor is going to do but you can control the images that you make and you should see this situation in as much of a 360 degree view as you possibly can under constraints you're working with. That is basically to have an ethical mindset in the first yeah. place. But um, um, that reminds me of your, your, uh, your dancing prisoner image, the, the truth or the lie in that situation. There, there are many different versions of the truth. Um, and yeah. uh, our responsibility as editors or as a writer, I'm, I'm not a, a full-time writer or anything like that, I, I write occasionally, but to me the, the, it, the image is either qualified or contextualized by, by the text that accompanies it, which is why captioning is so important. Um, yeah. And, and so also it, 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 it image? Pardon? No, I was asking Savannah if we have time for me to show the dancing man. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so. Okay. All right. We have uh, at least nine questions still from the audience and several from me that I'll shelve most of mine, but um, but we do have a few more questions, but I, I think I think that that's a useful example for sure. Okay, so um, so I'm going from Gordon Parks, I'm going to Jack Delano. Um, as you can see, he was active in the 1940s. That's him, Jack Delano. Worked for the Farm Security Administration, <coughs> excuse me, and the Office of War Information, the OWI. So here's a photograph that he made. 
1941, we're in a prison, a jail uh, in Greene County, Georgia. It's a very rural area. Um, it was formerly a slave uh, area, many enslaved people working on plantations in Greene County, Georgia. Uh, slavery ended in the 1860s, but um, racial oppression and the exploitation of black labor certainly did not. Uh, the marginalization of African Americans and uh, the denial of their fundamental constitutional rights did not end in the 1860s. And in fact, um, it was a pretty desperate place to be if you were black well into the 20th century, including 1941. So Jack Delano um, is down there on assignment for the Farm Security Administration. He's making pictures very, very broadly in Greene County. He's trying to photograph everything he can in Greene County. He's, the cities, the towns, the villages, the farms, labor, um, uh, retail, uh, factories. He's trying to do everything, social groups. So he's in the jail. He makes this picture. And um, he talks about it. He talks about being so excited to see this uh, and to capture this image. This image becomes quite well known and you can still buy it online today because, you know, it's the dancer has a kind of style and exuberance and, you know, and so, okay, so, so here is, um, like I say, you can still buy it online, you know, so here is Etsy and, uh, you know, it's only 35 bucks. It's in the public domain. Uh, so you can, you can buy it, you can display it, people like it. 273 people gave it five-star review. But in his memoir, Delano described making the photograph. So he's down there. But what happened was that the guy was not dancing of his own volition. He was in this convict camp with the guy he's working with, but also with a prison guard. And the prison guard who has courted him said, dance for the photographer. And Delano remembers snapping pictures as fast as I could, fearing that the guard might change his mind. I was nervous and excited. I blocked out all personal feelings. I had only one thought. I must not fail to get these pictures because it was so exciting because it was this brilliant moment. But he gets back to his hotel. Relaxing in my hotel room, I had a real realization of what I had witnessed, the bitter irony of a prisoner in striped attire combined with song and dance seemed almost heuristic. How humiliating it must have been for those men to be obliged to, be, to perform for me as if they were trained animals. And so, you know, we go back to this image and we, you know, we have to ask, okay, so is this an image that, you know, displays kind of the happy-go-lucky resilience of African Americans and their propensity for song and dance and joy? Or is this an image of a man who is performing under coercion for this white photographer in a suit because the guard has ordered him to because he knows to refuse to put on a show would get him into a whole lot of trouble. So, you know, there's that photograph is so layered. Um, you know, and, 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 and we frankly don't know what the truth is. You know, it is the man was dancing under compulsion. You know, right? He was he was under coercion. He knew that to refuse would be to get himself into trouble. But is it possible that he nevertheless took a moment of joy in in dancing? You know, was it possible that even while coerced, he was having a little bit of fun? You know, and then we saw him in a particular pose, and was that pose the real him, or is that simply a mask? Is he wearing a mask? Is he wearing a mask of the happy black minstrel um, for the photographer? You know, is he masking the truth of himself by performing a role? 
and you know, there are there are so many layers to that photograph um, that I'm eventually going to have to write about it, write about that single single photograph. Um, and it was it was used. You know, Delano was working for the federal government. Everything that he produced was in the public domain. Um, it was it was in fact used at the time, 1941 to reinforce the idea of the happy-go-lucky darky, um, and both happy-go-lucky and necessarily criminal. So it reinforced a couple of stereotypes about black men, you know, their fecklessness, their happy-go-luckiness, their talent for dancing and music. On the one hand, it also reinforces the stereotype of criminality, right? And it was used for those purposes at the time. I, th I think that there's uh, some... But we, you know, yeah, okay, but I just wanted to say that if we see it from the point of view of the men in the photograph, then, you know, what you are probably seeing is some sort of mask, right, is performing a role, and you're not getting even close to the reality of that man who's performing the dance. Mm. And it is, well, one last thing. <laughs> I'm deeply troubled that the photograph remains popular. It remains, because it's in the public domain, it's freely and then sell, and sell, as we saw on Etsy, to an eager audience. Um, and that eager audience is undoubtedly buying it and putting it up on their wall without knowing the context, without asking these questions. They are allowing it to reproduce those stereotypes. And so the, you know, <sighs> the photograph isn't dead. It's still alive. It's still doing work in the world. I, I think that's a really interesting example on many, many levels and, and obviously highly problematic as well. Um, and I think that you bring up a really important point about context and the role of context in understanding truth and lies, which Jenny has also mentioned in terms of, you know, when photographs move to different contexts and how that can, can influence, you know, what is true and what is lie as well. Um, and I see we have a question here from uh, Dennis that I think is also relevant. Um, asking if the photographer, uh, correct me, is it Delano? 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 Yeah, Delano. Delano. Um, if his interpretation Delano. of this image that he took is, can be considered authoritative in terms of the relationship between the prisoner and the prison guard. And I think that that's an interesting question because I think it points to, well, you know, so we as consumers have to understand the context that an image is taken in. And as photographers, what is our responsibility to understand the context that we're photographing in and how does that relate to this conversation of objectivity, truth and lies? Um, I don't know if you can comment. Either one of you would like to comment on that. Well, just on Delano, um, the only account we have of the making of that photograph comes from him and it's in his memoir. His memoir seems reliable. Right, so I know a lot about his biography and I know a lot about how, excuse me, the Farm Security Administration worked. And I would say, I have no reason to doubt his account. You know, I have no reason to doubt that the guard ordered the man to dance, that he was excited to make these photographs. But then when he got back to his hotel room, he had second thoughts and he understood how coerced this man was, and that he had been in some ways made to perform as if he were a circus animal. I have no reason to doubt that, uh, none at all. Um, and I also know how the photograph was used at the time. And like I said, it was used to reinforce stereotypes. Um, so I think his account makes sense and there are other uh, ways in which we can say that it probably happened that way. Other Farm Security Administration photographers were, for instance, accompanied by police on occasions in the South. So uh, there was another Farm Security Administration photographer called Marion Post Walcott, and she 
wanted to go to a black juke joint and she wanted to photograph in a juke joint. Now she's a white woman, of course. Mm -hmm. And, um, and the people that she was working with down there who were also white said, Oh no, 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 no. Be a really unsafe for you to go to a black juke joint. We can't, we can't allow that. And she's pretty headstrong. And she said, yeah, I'm going. And they said, well, we're going to send a policeman with you, a white policeman, you know, sort of to guard you. And so Walcott makes a very famous photograph of two African-Americans, a man and a woman, in the juke joint um, uh, jitterbugging. And so you see these two jitterbugging dancers. Great photograph. But she makes sure that in other photographs that she made in that juke joint, the cop is in the frame. You can see him standing off in the corner, right? And I said, God, she knew what she was doing. Didn't she know what she was doing? She's letting you know, at least when you go poking around in the archive, this is not an image that's ever going to get published, but it's going to be a record in the archive that that cop is over there. Mm -hmm. And you need to know that to understand this situation. So, yeah, I would say, I think, I trust Delano. I, I trust his, his account of that, of that episode. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. Would you, do you have anything to add to that, Jenny, or do you want me to, I do have I one think, question. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, I think, I think we can, I don't have anything to add. Um, the next question, I think, I, I think it reminds me of an uh, example that you, you gave to me previously, Jenny, so um, I think it, it could be quite relevant um, as well, is that, um, you know, recently, uh, there was some contention over who's trusted to tell stories about the Black Lives Matter protests in the United States. Um, and there's a specific case of Alexis Johnson. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but I'll share the link in the follow-up email. Um, and it, basically she, she was deemed as, and it, this goes as well to what you were describing at the start, um, John, about, you know, she was, she was deemed as not being objective because she was Black and she was not viewed as being able to objectively report on um, the, the protests. And she was actually barred from doing any reporting. And I um, obviously think this is a really, really relevant example if we're talking about um, objectivity and positionality. Um, and, and I guess I was wondering, especially in the newsroom, um, but, but why is it so important then uh, that we need, you know, we need a variety of viewpoints, surely, to better understand the world around us. And surely, um, photographing current events at any time, no matter our position, is is political in some way. So I guess I was wondering if you could comment in some way on sort of these lines that we have between um, objectivity and journalism, um, our positionality as individuals, and where is that line between, um, you know, activism, and how do we differentiate those and 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 pull those things apart? Sorry if that was unclear. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I think again this comes back to uh, the power of images, doesn't it? Because um, whether a photographer is working objectively or not um, affects the, the message that is sent out from the image once it's reproduced. Um, I, I'm thinking of uh, an image that I saw on a, I can't remember the website, um, not too long ago, where um, it was to do with the COVID reporting and a photographer demonstrated how it was possible to convey that people were or were not taking notice of the, the, the instructions for that were being, you know, social distancing instructions. So he stood across the, the street from the other side of the road and photographed the people walking along a pavement and they were all fairly uh, well spaced they were there was no sort of um, sort of mingling or anything going on and they had face masks and whatnot and it looked to all intents and purposes as if people were actually acknowledging what was going on and then he crossed the road and photographed down the street the people walking towards him and in that photograph it looked like a group of people who were very closely packed even though they were wearing masks there was no distance between them. You couldn't detect any distance. And to me, that was a good example of how a photographer who is objective or not objective, or tries to be as objective as possible, 
can influence the messages that are being put out and, and how the images are being used. Either they're being used as propaganda or they're literally reporting on the facts of the situation. Um, and, and it's so easily done. Whether a photographer will do it deliberately or not, it could actually just be complete naivety on the photographer's part, not realising that that image that they have captured might convey completely the wrong message. I don't know. I mean, um, some photographers are extremely astute and do understand these principles, but there are those that don't and who act naively and their images are then used and reused and reused, conveying that's those same messages that are intrinsically wrong, you know. Um, so objectivity is important from, uh, from the photographer. Um, and it ties in with the ethical stance of the photographer. Is it, does the photographer understand good ethics or not? You know, I think in lots of cases they just don't. Uh, it seems to me a lot of photographers now operate on the basis that their work is purely about winning awards and winning prizes for the, the money shots um, and the images that are going to be, you know, broadcast as broadly as possible throughout the media. Um, and I feel that there is something lacking in the education coming up for photographers there. Um, I don't know whether I'm just completely off the mark on this, but that's the impression I'm getting. It reminded me of the example that you gave about when you work in the newsroom, and I don't think, I don't think you've mentioned it in the panel, um, correct me if I'm wrong, about um, uh, trying to jog my memory now. Um, oh, about, about uh, father figures. Oh, yes. Did I not mention that earlier? I thought I had. Maybe. Um, I yes. Um, yes. It wasn't in the newsroom. I, I worked on the magazine. So I remember we had a, a, a feature that, uh, that came up uh, to do with uh, black fathers who are notorious, supposedly, for abandoning their children. Um, and um, the, the images that were requested were of these absentee fathers. Um, and um, I, at the time, uh, felt that at least one image should show a father, a black father with his family, within a family environment and setting, you know, an ordinary family. And everybody else in the room um, didn't just didn't seem to understand my point of view. Um, but my, uh, and my impression was that they were going based on these statistics that have been presented. Um, and, and I think they were basing their uh, feelings on statistics that were, were badly made and wrongly read, you know, because if you question a certain number of people within a certain context, a demographic, you'll get one answer. But if you broaden it out and, and examine lots of other people, you'll find something completely different. I, again, it comes down to a personal point in that I come from a family where my parents have been married up until my stepfather died two months ago nearly 60 years. My stepfather didn't abandon his family. Um, my grandparents were the same. I have cousins and rel other relatives, extended family who were the same. So I know for a fact that those statistics are wrong. Um, but somehow or other, this has become the moral orthodoxy that is being, put, that is being um, reiterated, um, propagated over and over again, that black fathers abandon their children, their absentees, you know. Um, and yeah, it, 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 it does. Um, relate to objectivity and it does relate to um, to the ethics in any situation are we are we basing our views on images or or situations that are just not the absolute truth or does the absolute do do we can we expect absolute truth or should we expect absolute truth you know um, I think the truth matters in lots of cases because people's lives have been damaged. Um, in America we see a situation that seems to be irreconcilable um, because of so many decades or years, hundreds of years of, of uh, dehumanizing a certain section of society which needs to be addressed and, it, and somehow or other it's not being addressed. You know? um, I don't know what else to add to that to be honest. <laughs> It, it, it's really frustrating and I, I you know as I say I, I, I you know, I'm 60 years old now and I, I still I feel as if this argument's been going on my whole life and nothing seems to be moving and nothing no progress seems to be made um, and which is why I feel we are now at a very crucial tipping point 
um, where the right questions need to be asked and the right actions need to be set in motion, starting with education. And I don't think, I, I think the, the, the point where people have picked up a camera and started taking photographs is too late because they've already been inculcated into a certain mindset from a very young age. Um, and I, I personally think the only way we're going to affect any kind of change is to start educate, educating them from a much younger age before they've got into that, that uh, got to the level where they're picking up cameras and photographing and reporting news because they've already got those unconscious biases. I could be wrong. Yeah. Um, can I go back to the, the example that you just used of the African-American reporter who was taken off the Black Lives Matter assignment? Yeah. Um, was that in Pittsburgh? I think so, yes. That was the Pittsburgh newspaper. Yeah. yeah. There was also, of course, a black photographer who was taken off the Black Lives Matter. Um, a beat. Um, I don't want to get into particulars of that, but I do want to say that, you know, both the photographer and the reporter were taken off the Black Lives Matter beat because they were seen as to be not objective, that their blackness necessarily made them not objective about reporting on Black Lives Matter. Now, of course, Black Lives Matter is a series of protests over the killing, the routine killing of innocent African Americans by the police, but much broader about the structure of American society and its racist and white supremacist social structure. You know, the people who are saying that they are not objective are the very people who benefit from white supremacy and, as I said earlier, patriarchy, right? So that the white people, mostly white men, who are looking at this reporter and this photographer saying, you're not objective because you're on the side of blacks, they are incapable of seeing that they themselves might not be objective and probably are not objective because they benefit from racism and sexism. That's one of the, the most powerful form of affirmative action in America, always has been, that, you know, that if you are white and male, you benefit from these structures. How can you be objective about something that you benefit from? Now, these the same questions that Gordon Parks was raising 50, 60, 70 years ago, that it's infuriating that, you know, the editors and publisher of the Pittsburgh paper were incapable of thinking through. And it's something that we absolutely have to reject. And we have to absolutely insist upon that as a beneficiary of a unjust system, you yourself have to question your own objectivity. And it might be that we turn it around and we say, no, we have to take all white people off the Black Lives Matter thing because they cannot understand Black Lives Matter. We have to take all white people off of it. You know, it, it's, it's infuriating on so many levels, but there's the really practical level that it is African-American journalists, commentators, academics, and other journalists, academics, commentators of color who have been insisting from the very start that the essential foundation of Trump's appeal is race and racism and racial resentment. It's the through thread is racism and white nationalism. We've been insisting on that from the very beginning and it's taken so long for the rest of the media to catch up with that. In fact, many of them have not caught up with that. There's this grudging acknowledgement now from major newspapers like Washington Post, New York Times, that yes, <laughs> the foundation of his appeal is to racial resentment, racism, white nationalism is the through thread. God, it's taken four years. And so, you know, if people are really angry well, this is one of the reasons, is that we're still fighting this battle for these voices to be heard and this for this perspective on the last four years, which has turned out to be so true. It's taken so long for white editors, white publishers to acknowledge that. It's really infuriating. And if they've been able to question the truth of their own vision, 
the truth, the objectivity of their own vision, if they've been able to question those things four or five years ago, yeah. reporting of the last four years would be very, very different. Absolutely. An ethical stance for those editors and uh, reporters to, to take would be to actually say, hands up, I can't report on this because I'm, I'm not best placed to, to actually be objective about it. So I suggest my ex-colleagues do it, my black colleagues or, or whoever is available to do this, somebody else other than me. That would be the ethical thing to do, I think. That's a good point as well, absolutely. Well, thank you both um, so much. We've come to the end of our time and I have to say, I feel like it's really, um, flown these two hours you know I, I definitely don't think there was a dull moment and i think that you both have, have really contributed something very valuable to this conversation so thank you so much do you have any um quick closing remarks maybe um in particular about why this matters now which you sort of already have have, have touched on john but um but yes yeah, something something that we can apply or look forward to um and in the meantime i'm just going to pop that survey link in the chat so if everybody wouldn't mind popping uh their responses so yes um i hand it over uh to whoever would like to make sort of cl any closing remarks john i think i allow you to do <laughs> oh i think we might have lost john john has gone John has gone. Um, Jenny, do you have any do you have any closing remarks while he regains his internet connection? I, I just just that I, I, I think I've already said that I think we are at a crucial point um, where we need to uh, be asking the right questions and um, educating ourselves so that we make the right decisions going forward. John has gone completely now. Um, <laughs> Um, you know, I can't really add any more than that, to be honest. Oh, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. Well, thank you so much for, for uh, your time. Thank you to everybody who has joined us. I really, really appreciate your giving the time to, to be here with us to, and to be part of these conversations. And thank you again to both uh, of the speakers. It's, it's been a really fruitful couple of hours. Um, I'll thank let you all go now. Thank you. Bye-bye.